Now, this is a story that kind of presents itself in this deadpan way as a, a true, as an essay, a literary essay about this fiction, about this author called Killian Turner, who uh, lived in the, he kind of came of age in the 70s and early 80s and wrote a few books and went off to live in Europe and so on, but it's kind of replete with footnotes and bibliographies and stuff. And so I had, much to my surprise, I had a lot of people kind of getting in touch, you know, including very well-read people uh, asking me why they couldn't find out too much more about this author and why, where they could get his books and so on. Uh, and so, you know, they, re they, they believed, well, it wasn't necessarily my intention, but they believed that it was a, a, a real author, so I had to kind of put them right. But actually, there were already traces of him on the internet because I had written articles and so on about him from other fictional personae. So it all got a bit confusing. In his late teens and early 20s, Killian Turner lived on the inheritance he had received upon his father's death. He did not pursue third-level studies, though he did continue to read as much and more widely than ever, nourishing keen interests in mythology, anthropology, and avant-garde physics. It was during this period that Turner began to imagine he could become a writer. At the age of 25, having published two short stories and several reviews in various Irish journals and newspapers, he set to work on his first novel. Edge of Voices took four years to complete and a further two to find a publisher, finally seeing print when its author was 31. Regarded from its first appearance as one of the true oddities of Irish literature, a literature hardly scarce of oddities, the novel is equal parts semi-autobiographical portrayal of an unremarkable Dublin adolescence and fantastical, eerie missive from the furthermost extremes of human experience. The story, such as it is, tells of a boy, Michael Kavanagh, similar in most ways to Turner, who, on the day of his Catholic confirmation, begins to receive, or believe he is receiving, telepathic messages from a hyper-intelligent presence, perhaps extraterrestrial or interdimensional in origin, which may once have inhabited the earth in corporeal form, but now exists only as an imperceptible atmospheric layer. Michael is deeply troubled by the messages, often, doubt, often doubting his own sanity. Yet he continues to live his outward life more or less as usual, enduring the timeless trials of adolescence and winning local renown as a fullback on the under-17 Gaelic football team. Then, after Michael reaches his 18th birthday, loses his virginity in what must rank as one of the most hilarious love scenes in Irish fiction, and applies to study European history at Trinity College, all in the same bittersweet week, the transmissions abruptly cease never to resume. The final 60 pages of the book are given over to an exegesis supposedly set down in the 4th millennium AD of the messages received by Michael over a three-year period during his adolescence. The implication seems to be that Michael has become some sort of messiah or the founder of a new religion or civilization. Edge of Voices was first published not in Ireland but in France and then in New York by small independent presses committed to the literary heterodox. Turner gave several readings in Paris where he gained minor cult status. Then, when he was 33, he received an Irish Arts Council bursary which he used to fund a trip around Europe. He travelled for three months, filling several notebooks with reflections on post-war Europe that were to inform his work for years to come. Instead of returning to Ireland after his travels, Turner settled in West Berlin, where he was to remain for the final three years prior to his disappearance. Throughout the early 80s, from the anarchist and bohemian neighbourhood of Friedrichshain he had made his home, Turner continued to send stories, essays and other increasingly uncategorizable writings almost exclusively to Irish journals, as if still engaged in a dialogue with the land he had otherwise reputed, repudiated. By no means all of these pieces were accepted for publication. Turner rented a small apartment in a block largely occupied by political radicals and artists and seemed to thrive in this environment. The poet Sarah Flanagan, who also lived in Berlin around this time and befriended Turner, later remarked that his, his apartment had something of the monk's cell to it. 
There was a stove, she said, a pot, a pan, a few cups and plates, a desk and a bed. Apart from that, the only things he had were books. Asked about Turner's social and romantic life in this period, she replied, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, for sure he was handsome and he had a certain charisma, but there was a a kind of privacy to him that went beyond simple introspectiveness, like he would only come out so far and then he'd step out into the grounds of the castle to meet you. He was never unfriendly, never cold, but there was a boundary. I used to wonder about his love life. He never told me about it, and when I asked, he was always wittily evasive. Later, of course, there were all the rumours, but I didn't know him anymore by that stage. I used to tell him he looked like Michel Foucault, with the bald head, the intense eyes, the glasses. He liked that. He rarely laughed, but he had a lively, faint kind of smile. I remember that. Living within sight of the Berlin Wall, steeped in the atmosphere of what he called the city on earth that has come closest to the core of the darkness, hearing the very beat of the devil's wing, Turner's lifelong fascination with Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, and the Second World War found endless stimulation. He took long, aimless walks through the city at all times of day or night, overcome with visions of the enormity that had been perpetrated there mere decades ago. Reading deeply from the literature of the war, Turner developed what he described as a merciless obsession with Hitler's plan, devised during the height of the Third Reich's reach and ambition to convert the island of Ireland into the granary of Europe, following the final triumph of Nazism. Turner's second book, The Garden, was the controversial fruit of this obsession. Coining the term Nazi pastoral to describe an almost aggressively uncategorizable work, critics were not quite sure how seriously to take its plotless, meticulously realized, deadpan portrait of an alternative, Nazified Ireland in which Hitler's plan has come to pass. Written in a documentary style recalling sociological surveys and governmental reports, the garden was, according to one critic, either a joke in questionable taste or the nostalgic, vindictive fantasy of a confused and lonely man whose bitterness has bred a disingenuous sympathy for the Nazis and for Hitler. Indeed, defenders of the book, who insisted it was an extended exercise in cautionary irony, foundered when they tried to explain away the all-too-convincing sincerity in Turner's depictions of a bucolic Ireland run by communities of agrarian fascists, where cheery colleagues Irish dance around swastikas and boys in the Hitler Youth of Ireland, whose honorary president is W.B. Yeats, are taught to hunt, cook and swim whilst having their imaginations fed by Celtic and Nordic mythology and receiving lessons in the rudiments of Darwinism and race theory. I'll leave it at that. I'm going to read a short excerpt on the Guinness Dadaists, um, and it reads thus. Ireland was an extremely chaotic place to live throughout the teens and twenties. Ireland was one of the poorest countries in Europe, with over half of Dubliners living in appalling slum conditions. Coupled with this poverty, the Irish were engaged in two wars, fighting World War I and a civil war against the British, who still occupied and ruled Ireland until 1922. The art scene in Ireland was split between conservative painters such as William Orpen and Sean Keating, who painted in a traditional style using Irish folk scenes as a subject matter, and more modern painters such as Mamie Jellett, who were interested in modern techniques such as abstract painting and very sensitive to developments in art on the continent. This split was again mirrored in literature. The nostalgic folk leanings of W.B. Yeats and his fellow Celtic revivalists were set against modernist experimental advocates such as James Joyce. Despite their differences, all these artists were dealing with how to negotiate one's identity and nationality. Dada in Ireland emerged as a product of and a reaction to these different senses of national identity. Indeed, it can be viewed as a synthesis of these polarities. The Irish Dadaists are often called the Guinness Dadaists because the three most active members of the group worked at the Guinness Brewery. This was important because unlike the other prominent artists and writers of the time, the Guinness Dadaists were working class. Guinness was a remarkably progressive employer. It was one of the few places they could have worked and actually had time to make art. The three main protagonists of the group were Dermot O'Reilly, Kevin Leeson and Brian Sheridan. 
The group was most active from circa 1920 through 1922. Led by O'Reilly, the group put on performances, wrote sound poetry, and produced drawings and sculptures. The Guinness Dadaists were pacifists where World War I was concerned, but not with regard to Irish Civil War. Brian Sheridan was a member of the old IRA. The term um, the old IRA is used to distinguish between the IRA who fought for independence in the Civil War and the terrorist force of the same name. The participation of members of the Guinness Dadaists in conflict set them apart from all other Dadaists and may have been the reason they were disconnected from other Dadaist groups. What we do know of the Guinness Dadaists' activities comes from O'Reilly's notebooks and papers held at Trinity College Dublin. These notebooks feature plans of performances, descriptions of sculptures made by Leeson and Sheridan, general notes and ideas. The entry dated April 12, 1921, for example, shows a rough plan for a wall hanging to be made by Leeson. Leeson was a cooper at Guinness, and the wall hanging was made from braces from barrels. O'Reilly describes in a later entry how he placed a pile of potatoes in front of the wall hanging and stood on the potatoes to perform, wearing a green jacket which he had twisted out of shape with wire. As well as the diaries, we have multiple examples of sound poetry written by the group. This is fortunate because very little of their drawings and sculptures survived the Civil War. O'Reilly's notebooks detail the different methods of declamation that were used. Some poems were designed to be performed simultaneously, creating a cacophony of sound. Sheridan, in particular, was very interested in different types of chanting. Other poems were extremely rhythmic and percussive. The Guinness Dadaists' sound poetry is interesting because it is written mostly using the Irish alphabet following Irish rules of pronunciation. Irish is one of the most difficult languages in the world to pronounce, and decoding the poetry for performance can only be done by Irish speakers. While the Guinness Dadaist's choice to work with Irish was a political one, it was not nostalgic. It was not about looking to folk culture for a sense of identity. The Guinness Dadaists used Irish as a medium rather than a symbol. If anything, they sought to weaponize it. O'Reilly wrote how the Irish language is a material which can be broken into fragments which can be mobilized against all sense and meaning. In this, they forged a completely new way of dealing not only with art and language, but also with nationality and identity. That gives you an idea of why Rob and I have some common territory and probably our, least, yeah. our great spiritual ancestor is Flan O'Brien. I think we would both agree that Flan... Or, 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 or Borges. Yeah. Or Bo- I think yeah, Borges yeah. also yeah, very, yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Um, so maybe we could kick off that way. I know that often when I talk about this project... Um, I often talk about the Borges story, Talon, Ukbar, yeah. Orbis, Tertius, yeah. um, about this idea of like an, exci- an encyclopedia which describes a, an alternate reality yeah. as if it's real, and then objects from that alternate reality start to make themselves manifest in yeah. this. So, so how, what's your relationship with Borges when it comes yeah. to these ideas? Uh, and to Flann O'Brien too, I guess. Well, first of all, though, when you talk about the mutual territory and so on, I have to say, I was struck by how almost uncanny the similarities are between what you were doing and what I was doing. Uh, like the style, the tone, the kind of deadpan humour, I felt it was almost like, it's weird, it was almost like seeing my own prose and my own uh, th- thing on, on, the, on the page. So somebody like Borges, mm-hmm. yeah. which is bringing it away from the discussion of Irishness and identity, but still, he... That, he He changed the game for me. Mm -hmm. And then also reading, I think we may have touched upon this in an email or something, also reading uh, Roberto Bolaño, Mm -hmm. who is uh, still, I I find his literature electrifying Mm -hmm. hugely, so almost as much as Mm -hmm. Borges or Joyce or whoever. And he has a great book called uh, Nazi Literature in the Americas, which... For anyone who doesn't know it, it's an, a novel in the form of a compendium, a kind of encyclopedia from an alternative reality of uh, Nazi literature in the Americas, of Nazi art, Nazi poets, you know, and Nazi crime novelists, and it's bizarre, but very funny, very deadpan, and uh, that that was a huge kind of. And also, he's written lots of other stories and fictions about mm-hmm. fake, um, fake, fake novelists and so on. But a lot of the Flan O'Brien stuff, uh, where he, he really messes around, mucks around with this kind of thing, apart from the, like the, 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 no, the novels, like the metafictional stuff in the novels, I didn't really know about it. And, uh, even the bit that you have 
in the well, book. That's, that's not Miles. It's not real. No. It's not. I believed it. Yeah, yeah. We have fake, uh, fake Miles Nogopoli. Yeah, well, it was convincing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we have a fake Christian because, be, because he doesn't so. talk about the Guinness status, he talks about the Irish status. Yeah, so I just thought status. it was one of his comic <laughs> conceits. You that's know? written by an Irish, an Irish um, writer who, was, who just did his uh, PhD on, on Beckett and oh. astrology. Beckett and astrology. Oh, that's a, so, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a so, I mean, it's uh, interesting because I think I think I almost think like Flan O'Brien is a given condition, mm. and it's sort of you absorb it, absorb it. Yeah. Um, you sort of absorb it as if it's in the water. Um, yeah. Up in Ireland, whereas I think for me the the closest references I have. I, I think Borges is really important. And right. Talon Opar, if I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah, I'm sure you are. Yeah. Tertius, um, that's a story that's really important to me for yeah. this idea that like a story can be a fake can be a fake article yeah. that you can say, here's something that reads like the instructions for a Hoover, yeah. but it's actually a short story. And still gripping, still, still full gripping, of magic, mystery. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that applies equally well in music, is that you're saying to people, here's something which is supposed to be a recording that was made in a, you know, on a really bad tape recorder in a bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But it's been constructed so that that acoustic sound of the bad tape recorder and the bar is part of the Right, part of so the it's a fiction design. within the sound design. Exactly, Interesting. exactly. Interesting. Yeah, but yeah. I know for me that... I think um, one of the writers I really, I think probably w one of the writers that has have been quite influential on my thinking in regard to these sort of speculative fiction is uh, Sanslaw. Uh, Sanslo Lem. Lem, Lem yeah, yeah, yeah. And and sort of his book um, where he's doing fake book reviews of books that didn't exist. Does he? You know, right, and, know, and you're sort of reading what you think, this is really brilliant, I don't need to read the book because like, he's yeah, going yeah. into such detail of his fake book review. Yeah. But I always come back again also, and it's funny because the excerpt that you read sort of touches on this, that I think one of the, the best ways I've, the best sort of ways I've, I've, I've heard a writer talk about um, how to deal with life is the science fiction writer William Gibson. Oh, okay. And yeah, I'm yeah. a massive Gibson fan. I love fan. Gibson, yeah, yeah. And he talks about how, um, he, th he says, well, look, if you were to try and describe current reality to somebody, you would say to them, I've got this idea for a book. And the book's going to be set at a time in the future where the climate has overheated and, you know, uh, climate change and catastro catastrophe is incipient and it's going to happen. And Donald Trump's running for president, yeah. right? <laughs> Donald Trump is running for president. Yeah, yeah. And a socialist, you know, Jewish guy is running, you know, is yeah. also running for president. Yeah. And there's this disease that people get through sexual transmission and it's decimating Africa. And there's another disease that mosquitoes give you, but you don't know you have it and it gives you birth defects. Um, you know, and you went through all of this, people would say that's just a bit too sci-fi, yeah, yeah. it's a bit too, too weird. Um, yeah. So sort of Gibson's perspective is that in order to talk about contemporary reality, you have to use the tools of sci-fi, yeah. because they're the tools that are appropriate to the reality in which we live. And so the idea that Killian Turner is writing a novel, which is essentially a sci-fi novel with a 4,000 years yeah. in the future superhuman intelligence yeah. um, coming back to you, that yeah. sort of seems appropriate as a way to approach both music and literature now, yeah. rather than writing a straightforward, a straightforward form. I feel that for much of my life I was a kind of a, a traitor, you know, a traitor to, a, like a, to, to, to Ireland or something like that. I, was, I had a real sense of uh, cultural boredom or something like that. I mean, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, in my 20s and early 20s and so on, I felt a, a sense of, oh, it's, de it's, it's a desert, you know, there's nothing going on. And so all, almost all of my, not all, but almost all of my big cultural like, fascinations and, and major influences for a, a long time were, uh, were not Irish, you know, and even the greats, like even the Beck, you know, I was fascinated by the Beckets, the Joyce, and to, to, also to a lesser extent, and then later Flann O'Brien, but they, they still didn't mean as much to me as whoever, Nietzsche or Borges or, or whatever, and, uh, and that came part and parcel with an attitude, a kind of bad attitude, you know, of like, I thought, shit, anything Irish is, is kind of crap, and but, you know, then you get older and you mature, or you, you don't mature, but you, you try to mature, you know, and you, and you, and you start to think, well, any, any asshole can sit and say how bad everything is, you know, back home, and, you know, it's all so much better elsewhere. But then that's a, that's a, that's a kind of weak attitude, so you start thinking, well, if you don't like how the game is being played, then change how it's mm -hmm. being played and try to contribute. And I was just wondering about that. You, you, one of the notes I wrote from the book in your introduction you write this lovely phrase which is you're saying that it was your intention and your collaborators intention to write 
our ancestors, our artistic ancestors, to write our ancestors into being and shape their stories uh, with care. And I was, I was wondering, was that your kind of an intention? Was it the same thing? I feel in a kind of somewhat frustrating uh, uh, barrenness in the, let's say, the Irish cultural mm-hmm. landscape, and then wanting to come back and wanting to kind of uh, say, well, okay, instead of just saying, you know, it's easy to look back on the past and say, oh, you're a Catholic puritanical. Why not kind of reinvent the past with some kind of love and some kind of, you know, fantasy that isn't just a, a kind of idle fantasy, but has the kind of germ of some mm-hmm. future? It, it, it was. It was the same sort of thing. I yeah. mean, I always, I don't know. I think whatever happened in my upbringing that there was just part of me that liked very strange avant-garde art and thought that was amazing and exciting. Like, I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, being as a teenager, reading a description, I think it was of George Machunis' funeral from Fluxus where the the food was dyed purple and there was a lecture about bananas and the recordings (laughs) of toilet flushing. And I was like, I want to hang out with those people. (laughs) They they seem really exciting, you know? And you've got this weird thing in your head where you're thinking, well, the... The people I wanted to be there for me, like my weird ancestors, didn't exist. Do you know what I mean? Musically in the country that I'm from, and so how do I deal with that? But the great thing is now, you just decide what you want to do. (laughs) And it will always still be you, because it it doesn't matter how many fancy hats you put on. And and I always think of, like, um, the Beatles, one of the best songs they ever made was Norwegian Wood, and that was them trying to write a Bob Dylan song, because they just heard Bob Dylan, and it had blown their mind. And they said, let's try and write, you know, he's the future, what we're doing is like bubblegum. And, like, can you imagine, like, One Direction deciding, yeah, we're going to write a, you know, a Radiohead song, you know what I mean? And it just comes out as this weird pop song, so... Um, so, and, but, so the Beatles still remain the Beatles, but they wrote Norwegian Wood, and it was like a Bob Dylan song with a sitar solo, yeah. you, you know. Uh, uh, and, and so I think that's the thing is that that's why I enjoy trying these different. I, I'm very much I like Judith Butler. I think that identity is a construction. It's something that we perform, and, and we choose whether we like it or not to, to perform certain acts every day, which reinforces aspects of our identity to everybody. Um, and so I do believe that that's true. But the fun thing is that you can just play with it yeah. and try different things on. People say, you know, are you not afraid of being so influenced by what you write, you know, that it's not your own and this kind of thing. And, and then I talk to other writers and I can't help but feeling a kind of horror bordering on outrage when they tell me, oh yeah, I'm writing my new novel now, so I'm not reading a thing for the yeah, next year. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. oh, that's terrible, terrible, because I feel... Yeah. No matter how influenced you are by the stuff that's coming in, you're just getting closer to yourself. You know what? When you read something, or when you see something, or you know when you're moved by something, or when you're really blown away by a piece of art, it's because it's kind of resonating with something in your own subjectivity. Maybe something that you haven't quite uncovered yet, yeah. or or, this, or 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 connected with. And so then, when you create. No matter how kind of blown, like but the Beatles and right, Norwegian Wood with Bob Dylan, no matter how overawed you are and blown away by it, it's still going to be filtered through your own. You can't, again, you can't get away from it, even if you wanted to. It's still going to be you, you know? Why would you want to shut yourself off? And, uh, absolutely. And, um, and even if I try to do a version of somebody else, I'm going to end up messing it up. Yeah. And the other way. E- even if you almost consciously attempted to recreate yeah, the style of someone, you yeah. it screw it up because it's you and you can't get away from that. Totally. Thing. And believe me, in making a project where we had to have over two hours of music, you know, you're sort of going, Oh, okay, I'm going to have to make it weirder. Okay, think more like a nun in, a, in an enclosed convent, you know, who hasn't heard drone music. But, you know, so, so I think you, you have to keep... You, and and I, I think part of the alter ego is a way of trying to push yourself into these little cracks of yourself that you didn't know, you know, existed. It seems to me that literature is as big correct me if I'm wrong, but almost as big an influence on you as uh, music. Like, I'm very interested in language, maybe is even a better right. way of putting it, in yeah. that, like, I think that language is a very rapid barometer of what's happening. So I find Twitter really amazing. Do you? Yeah, really interesting. And I follow a lot of, like, when people look at, because, you know, most composers, they get on Twitter and then they just try to follow all the people that other composers are following because oh, they yeah. think, oh, I'll just complete the circle. Yeah, yeah. But I follow mostly... Um, what they call weird Twitter writers. Oh, yeah. So I see like a lot of strange jokes that people are making or experiments mm. with language. 
And, and so that's what I'm interested in. I like, I think, conceptual poetry, flarf, all that sort of stuff is very interesting to yeah, me. Yeah. I like, like, Tao Lin, like these books that you read that just read, like, that they're actually really annoying to read because they just read, like, yeah. sort of affectless people who are on a lot of meds yeah. writing on, um, you know, G-chat or something. Yeah. But I think that that's really interesting because it's sort of giving you a very quick quick sort of litmus tests of what the cultural conditions that you function in are, like mm. how people choose to communicate, whether they use emojis, you know, whether they yeah. spell things. I, I love emojis, yeah. Emojis are very interesting. I'll put them in my next book. <laughs> put them in your next book. Uh, there's actually an emoji translation of Moby Dick called Emoji Dick, <laughs> where they went through the love entire it. of Moby Dick and then took each sentence and then people went and translated that sentence oh, into wow. emojis. Wow. So it's just an entire, yeah. an entire, an entire one. Oh. But uh, no, but I think like so. That's all very. I think that's very interesting. I also like playing. Like the thing I like about people like Borges. I really like Ben Marcus, Lydia Davis, mm. um, George Saunders. I think is interesting as well. Yeah. I like people who mess with form. Yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah. So yeah, sure, I like the sure idea that yeah. it, it, you're reading something and the affect of it seems to be like with your Killian Turner story. You're thinking this seems like an, a nice tidied up like it was maybe an academic essay that was tidied up for the London Review of Books yeah. like that's you know I'm feeling that I'm in authoritative hands yeah. do you know what I mean but maybe a little bit more poetic detail than I would get in an yeah. academic essay yeah. I like playing with those those sort of formats and I sure. and I use a lot of language in my work I obviously not in the piece I did last night but I think some of you guys were at I did um, a piece in the Music Current Festival a couple of weeks ago called The Total Mountain which is sodden with text do you know so when oh, I'm yeah. looking I'm thinking, as a vocalist who performs, I'm thinking, that text, how does it sound? What's the voice that's making it? Do you know, how does that, how does that work? How, how does that function? So they're massive, I mean, massive, massive influences on me. And I have a lot yeah. of friends who are writers who are, always, who are right. always saying, read this, you should change yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know? So. Yeah. I like spaces to be difficult at times. Right. We had a, a discussion recently about the comments that David Norris made about Nova, about the Nova radio program, uh, where he made some comments um, in the Doyle where he oh, said... Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, was he talking about Nova? He was talking about Nova. I thought he was talking about uh, young music in oh. general. <laughs> like, you know, I, the, I think it was about Nova. He said, you know, they've, they've taken Gloria, which was a beautiful religious program, uh, religious music program yeah, off yeah. the air, and instead... And they're keeping Nova, and I think he said something like, "And it's full of coughs and splutters." Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I was thinking, "And Ulysses, because that's an easy mm. read, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. let that's, alone that's Finnegan's sort of, Wake." Yeah. You, you know, Finnegan's Wake, and, yeah. and you sort of think, like, we have, we understand that Ulysses is really difficult. Sure. We understand that, and and I mean, uh, like, that we understand. Although not, not as much as people seem to believe, that's, <laughs> but that, that's what I feel. That's know? what you feel. Yeah. But it, but I don't sit down thinking I'm going to watch Ulysses in the same way that I say I'm going to sit down and you know watch Game of Thrones. Yeah, you know, yeah. You think this is okay, going to be some I'm hard work, engage, yeah. but I'm going to engage. But I'm going to feel alive and confused, yeah. and like I'm not sure what's going on, and I have to work at it. And that's sort of a really valuable experience to have. And I think that music and art should be like that. Yeah. I believe that you should go, uh, you should go to a concert and feel awake and engaged, and like you're having to sort of make decisions and think about things rather than going. Oh, this is lovely and pretty, and you know, and I can just sort of let it wash over me. I, I at the same time, I love to listen to music that's beautiful and pretty. Yeah. But you know, I what I want is I want something that I feel is sort of going like, look at the world you're in. <laughs> you know, like you're yeah. here right now. We're all alive, and that's insane. You know, and and let's try and deal with that. Kind of as a reader, I do want to be kind of, I want to be kind of taken care of in a sense you know mm -hmm. I don't want I, which is not to say I shun difficulty or anything like that but I want it to be I want to know that the writer there is and there is an attempt to connect it's not purely solipsistic or something like that and 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 so mm -hmm. no matter how kind of out there you know the stuff I write gets or no matter how weird or whatever I want I feel there always there always has to be a kind of seduction principle going on where you want, no matter how bizarre you bring, you want to keep the reader there. You want to keep Oh, I them. agree with you, yeah, actually, yeah. completely. Yeah, I yeah. think it's that, I think that I think of it that, like, I always think that with music, you're talking about, most music, you're talking about a frame of time. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I feel what's really important is that you manage that time. Okay. And that you really have an acute sense. <coughs> and, and I always think... Like Marina Abramovich, the performance artist, she talks about how like the medium that she makes her work out of is en the energy that exists between people. And right. I think so. When you're a musician, you have to have an awareness of that. Yeah, you yeah. have to have an awareness of like, and because I do a lot of free improv, that's the best arena 
to sort of learn that because you're in a room with people and you're sensing things that you don't even know quite how to articulate it yeah. and you're pushing things and pulling things according to that in a way that you would never be able to actually linguistically relate yeah. in a way that was that, that made any sense but yeah. I think I, I, I think that I like I want always to feel that even if something's really challenging that the person is 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 aware you, you know yeah, what I mean yeah, yeah, so I don't yeah, mean yeah. that the art is solopsistic okay. I think you can yeah, have yeah. something that's solipsistic and it has the same affect as an episode of Friends yeah that yeah yeah posted. sure yeah but but I want to feel that that the, the person is there really considering what's going on yeah the impulse to write just comes more from an energy you know like I don't write every day you know this kind of thing like you wake up at eight in the morning and no matter what you churn out a thousand words I just I can't I don't like it. I don't, you know, I, um, you don't want to mythologize or mysticize the kind of creative idea and the creative impulse or whatever and say, oh yeah, when the muse is upon me, I shall create. It, no, I don't see it like that, but I do think that it's good to write for me when I feel it, when I have something to say so that I'm not just kind of churning stuff out, you know, and often it, it's kind of a welling up. Like I won't write for for weeks on end and there's anxiety there and there's a kind of doubt oh Christ like what if it never comes again but then there's a welling up and it's usually something I've been thinking about kind of ruminating on and it's almost a, a welling up in the, in the in the guts or something and then when I sit down I'll, it, it'll come out you know so um. I would say um, for me I, I'm actually a little bit more probably from the convent school education I'm a believer in you get up and you just show up and you do it yeah. and, and you do it day after day and you know that these moments of magic will happen that you can't predict but but you just have to sit down and just do it um, and then there's times when I feel completely like I have to go and do it right now but but I'm also sort of like right I have a I have a two-hour window before I have to jump on a plane so I need to get it done but I mm. do think that that these the conceptual approach I, I have lots of pieces that I approach conceptually but I don't care about the concept what I care about is the result and I will happily throw everything in the bin even if the concept is really smart and if I don't think that the result that I get is interesting so I would differ from a pure conceptual artist all of those things were different ways of experience and interacting with them but I think ultimately the whole thing is that it's just a way to find new things it's, it's a way to try and find um, these new bits of sound that are exciting and interesting and feel inspiring, you know, um, that feels like, like sort of my dream with this is always, and, and the project that I did before it, Group At, which was a project where I had nine different alter egos, all born in the 70s, who were part of a sound art collective based in Tala called Group At, um, that did like interventions in the square shopping center. And with Group At, I always said, my intention is that a kid would pick up the book and think, I can do weird art because lots of other people are doing it too. And you know, there's a drag queen that like did a performance with all the, the piano students in, in Tala and had them play, you know, had them play pieces with their house windows open and stuff. And um, so, so sort of, for me, it's about just trying to make this big world and, and try and honor the ghosts of the people who didn't make it through that got lost in a bottle or ended up in a, you know, in an orphanage somewhere. Right?